Welcome to Creating World Abundance podcast, and I'd like to introduce you guys to my to my first new guest to our rebranded show, uh, Vicki Griffith, who is an unconditional weight loss coach, and I'd love for uh, us to have a conversation and see where it goes, but uh, Vicki has got some really, really cool stuff that I think would be a benefit to everyone, including myself as I struggle with a condition called fatty liver disease. So uh, I'm certainly looking forward to hearing what we can come through here. So Vicki, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got into what you're doing now and really who are, who is it that you're really trying to focus on help in this unconditional weight loss space? So where was I in the past? I was fat. <laughs> That's, where I was in the past. That's where I was at. I was fat from the minute I was born. And that's really cute when you're a toddler, but it doesn't get so cute when you're six and 12 and 24 and beyond. And so I struggled with trying to lose weight. I really didn't understand that, that I was different until I was about 10. That's when it really became very clear to me that weight was an issue and it was an issue for everyone else. My mom took me to the doctor and the doctor prescribed speed because that was the appetite suppressant at the time. Uh, being a very reserved, some people would have called me shy, but a reserved individual. I don't think I stayed on that for very long because I probably drove my mom insane <laughs> with all the energy that I had. So that's when I realized, though, there was something wrong with me. And then from that moment on, I struggled with losing weight. I'd lose a few pounds, gain it back, gain more, lose a few pounds, gain it back. Tried every diet. I don't know if you did the, the grapefruit diet and the cottage cheese diet. I've been on every big box diet that there's there's been. Um, Although I'm surprised, I, I kind of study dieting now and I'm surprised at what they still come up with. Really? To, yeah, crazy programs. Um, there was one called the hard boiled egg diet just recently. Thank you. That's hard boiled weird. egg diet. I mean, I remember when I, back in my drinking years, I used to do pickled eggs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Different story anyway. So it gave you some protein anyway. <laughs> it, it did, right? Late at night. Um, didn't smell so good the next morning though. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> so so you know having gone through the 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 fad of dieting and, and i think a lot of a lot of what our culture is looking at today is is not so much you know diet but more lifestyle changes right i mean one of the things that as i'm getting older i just turned 56 last week and as i'm getting older i'm starting to realize that you know i can't abuse my body like i used to when i was in my 20s and 30s i need to be a little bit more proactive in changing my lifestyle so you know, one of the things that my wife and I are looking at doing is, is going back onto a keto style diet, but it's not so much the diet as is, is, is the lifestyle, getting rid of the grains and the cereals out of our, out of our system, right? And <laughs> I don't know about you, where you fit into the grains and cereals thing, but I, I was just reading an article the other day that, uh, and I don't know if, how accurate this is, because you know, it's off the internet, but it, it looked like it was a valid news story that, uh, um, some folks have taken a roundup to court. They're in the process of taking them to court because they found it carcinogenic. And then when we think about, you know, folks that have uh, celiac disease, uh, you can go over to Europe and you can eat the bread over in Europe and it doesn't bother you. Well, and that's because they banned glyphosate over the, over spraying glyphosate, which is roundup over there 40 years ago. And here in North America, you know, in the, in the late nineties, the, the, the amount of spraying of glyphosate just went through the roof just through the roof. And so I think there's a huge link. And this is one of the things that I've found powerful, especially with my brain, is it really becomes really important the food we eat, not only for how our body feels, but for how our brain functions. So I would absolutely agree with that. However, if your mind isn't in the right place to be able to stick to some kind of program like what you're talking about, then it's a hundred times more difficult, even though you've made the choice. And 
this is what I also understand that regardless of what the food is, if you believe it's healthy for you, it is. <laughs> so Wayne Dyer, my favorite quote ever from Wayne Dyer is if you truly believe that you could eat five hot fudge sundaes every day and lose weight, you can. And that sums it all up. So some people's version of healthy to lose weight is vegetarian or vegan or other people, you know, if I have clients that are doing like you are talking keto or Atkins or low carb. And so when we're having sessions together, it's almost like it's a confession. Well, I had a potato yesterday. I'm like, so what makes a potato a horrible food? Well, I'm on this low carb, it's got a lot of carbs, blah, blah, blah. However, I said, if you were a vegetarian, that would have been a perfect food. So we need That's to right. start changing our rules around what food is and pay attention. Like you said, what's the physical results of what you're eating? And your body will always tell you whether it's good for you or not. But the mind has to decide if it's going to put up with that or not. Right. And a lot of, you know, a lot of times, you know, where I came from as fat and feeling that I wasn't worthy and I had a lot of self-doubt and a ton of self-criticism about everything I did in my life, including you know, in school year school, had to be perfect. I had to be perfect. Yeah. I've learned a long time ago that perfect isn't profitable for one in business. <laughs> and no, it's not. <laughs> there's no such thing as a perfect lifestyle. You know, even though you've made this decision and, and good for you and you're gonna go on this program, I bet you sometime in your life you're gonna wanna eat a brownie. It doesn't mean that that's bad or you went off the program or that it's going to sabotage you for the rest of your life if you have that mindset. However, as a chronic dieter or a professional dieter, if I had a brownie, that meant that I'd gone off my diet. So therefore, let me go eat another piece of pizza or let me go eat this bag of potato chips or how about the sleeve of cookies because tomorrow I'll start the diet. And that all or nothing mentality starts creeping in and we're in this yo-yo constantly. So and that's that's what I wanted to stop. Right. That that constant, you know, mental, mental anguish, I think almost anguish. You know, um I have a, I have a daughter and, and and my mom also, they struggle with weight issues as well. And and one of the challenges that that I see them facing is, you know, they're I, I look at it as a core belief that you know they're looking at their lives like maybe they're not worthy or they're not deserving somewhere deep down inside they don't like themselves mm -hmm. and and i i, I honestly i kind of i can relate to it because of my alcoholism and addiction i can relate to that part but how do you fix that like how do you change that part of your mind that allows you to um that allows you to to move to the next level and get on with your life to put that old part of you past you. I mean, we see all kinds of success stories. And then I look at my, my daughter and my mom, for example, they, they've struggled with overweight issues their entire life. My daughter's 20, 26. My mom's 78, right? Mm -hmm. what, what, what words of wisdom could you throw out there that, that might help them to go, yeah, I think that's the issue or, what, what, where do we start, for example? Like, I know when you, when you, I mean, you, you admitted that you were fat growing up, that right there in itself is a stigmatism or, you know, that, you know, how do we talk about that, right? I mean, my, my uh, five-year-old granddaughter calls my mom fluffy. <laughs> she's not fat, she's fluffy, right? Which is cute. But, you know, at some point, you know, there's going to go like my, uh, my grandson, asked asked my daughter are you are you having twins because you're bigger than my mommy and he was oh five years old as well right <laughs> didn't right. know right didn't know just innocence right but how does that because that that plays really big on your mental on your mental game right so how do you how do you turn that around well first it's awareness so first is the awareness is i want to do something about this so that it becomes a choice you have a choice how am I going to change this? And before you even get into strategy, because strategy is the diet. 
Strategy is the exercise plan. And just like in business, there's a ton of strategies. You can do online marketing, you can do email marketing, you can do, I mean, there's a ton of tactics and strategies out there. But unless you're in the mind game of being able to fulfill and complete them, then it's not worth it. All that money spent. And, and I'm, I can say, I've done this. I've spent money on things for my business thinking, oh, this is it because they've showed me the results. And this person made six figures in two hours and I can do that too. And then I get in the middle of it and discover it's kind of a hard work. <laughs> There's a lot around it that I didn't think. And then I, you know, kind of goes by the wayside. Same thing with releasing weight and notice I said releasing weight we're not in the weight loss game weight loss to the mind the mind freaks out it goes oh my gosh I lost something I need to find it and think about the panic you have when you misplaced your cell phone right right the, the mind freaks out it panics that's the same thing that happens when you say weight loss I did that just before a call by the way I, I lost my phone <laughs> Freaked out. And you panicked, right? A little bit of panic happened and your mind's freaking out and all the bells and whistles are going off in your mind. And so cutting, staying out of the weight loss game, that's that's one of the things as well. So there's, there's a piece between deciding, I'm going to do something about this and the strategy, what's the diet I'm going to go on. And that piece in between is looking at where did this come from? And this is hard sometimes. Where did this come from? Why am I feeling this way or acting this way? Sometimes our habits are based out of experiences when we were young and we haven't even associated the two. Right. So a client might have a sweet tooth. Well, myself, for example, I love sweets, absolutely adore them. And I look backwards, I look at my grandmother on my mom's side who was obese. And she had candy dishes, not dish, dishes, probably 10 different kinds of candies on her dining room table at all times. I knew that if I wanted something sweet, I could ride my bike down there and I could get anything and as much as I wanted. Right, right. So I've always had that sweet, sweet taste. And, and then what happened is sweets became my comfort. And so did all kinds of other food and feeling overstuffed became my comfort. And I had to go back and look at that and investigate it and be willing to release all of that so that it was no longer a driving habit, which I look at, at neuroscience and I look at psychology, which is the mind. And I look at what's going on in our brain. So that habit of going to my grandmother's to get something sweet when I had a bad day at school and I was a latchkey kid for quite a long time. So between school and when mom and dad came home, I could grab my bike and go to grandma's and go get you know several pieces of candy after a bad day at school. That became etched in my brain. And so now as an adult, have a bad day at work, however you define that. Yeah. And I, I crave something sweet. So there's a connection there that once you realize it sometimes can be I like to use the word broken, can be dislodged, healed, moved, and then a new neural pathway, a new thought pattern, and a new behavior is created through repetition. Right. And that is how you react and act to things rather than the old way of turning to food. So that's, that's very similar to the way my brain works in my alcoholism and my addiction, right? Like mm -hmm. when, I, when I get stressed about whatever it is, or I have an excuse to go drink, um, instantly my brain goes down that pathway that is, you know, for better part of 40 years was a four lane highway for me. Um, and now that I'm in recovery, it's it, thankfully it's becoming a, a, an overgrown grass grown trail. It's not no longer a four lane highway. And I'm using better pathways to deal with and manage with my other things. But I think what you mentioned earlier on there, and I'm just gonna go back to my notes here, Awareness, I think, is the really key thing. And a lot of times, at least from my own, my own experience, we're not willing to change until there's, it's a life altering event, right? Uh, for me, my alcoholism, it was, you know, God smacking me upside the head with a four by four and telling me to take notice. Um, so what, what can, you know, guys like me or, or, or family members, 
that have have uh, family members that are struggling with with overweight issues and eating disorders, if you will, what can we do to help support them so that we can, instead of, I don't want to use the word nag, but there's there's a lot of times that that's the way it comes across, you know, it, what can we do to help support them in that journey, in that in that awareness, you know, journey from awareness to let's make a choice to now we're going to change our lifestyle. Well, I love this question. So thanks for asking it. And um, nagging becomes shame. Yeah. And then shame becomes guilt and then becomes unworthiness and not enough. And so certainly becoming the food police, even if they ask you, don't do it. (laughs) Don't do it. Oh, really? My wife is a, she's an amateur bodybuilder and, and she has a weakness for snacks and she's holding me accountable to say, Hey, help me. If I start snacking, you know, slap my fingers and say, no, stick, help me stick to my, my routine. Right. So you're saying, no, stay away from that because it goes from nagging to shame, to guilt, to remorse. Right. Is that what to, you said? To remorse? A remorse of some kind, which in my experience would make me go eat more and binge more in secret you know, secret eat and have dozens and dozens of Girl Scout cookies under my bed. I no wonder I was the leading number one Girl Scout salesperson because <laughs> I bought them all and put them under my bed. So that's what that would would lead to. I felt that people were watching me, and many times I did. What I was eating, how much? Then it just want. I just wanted more. I just wanted to go eat more. So that's not necessarily the way to go. No. Um, being the role model. So eating healthy for your ideal weight. Watch your judgment around food. So telling someone that a milkshake isn't nutritional, although you may be 100% right, and it may not be right for everyone. Um, It's certain, you know, and you're coming from it's not right for me, so therefore it shouldn't be right for you. Right. Uh, that's not a place to go to either. So um, if my husband asked me to be his food police, I would decline that responsibility that would create tension mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for me to have to take the resp- that responsibility. It's like when I went to a conference once and I was set up with a roommate that I didn't know. And the, the thing she said to me just before we fell asleep is, hey, by the way, if I stop breathing, um, just just shove me and I'll wake back up because I could die. And I'm serious this happened to me. <laughs> Sleep out. Do you think I slept that night? No, definitely not. Mm-hmm. So it's the same kind of thing as putting a responsibility for yourself on someone else, but no one should be taking that responsibility. Now you have an agreement with your wife, so um, you have communication, open communication, I'm assuming, so that you realize that you're not, when you say that to her, you're not shaming her or guilting her. But in most cases, that's how it feels. Um, Be careful of your own sabotaging their efforts. So I had a client who came to me. His wife had been my client. She had released 50 pounds. He needed to release some weight. And we had an interview. So I knew he was on board taking 100% responsibility. But he came in, this very gentle giant, livid one day to our appointment. I'd never seen this side of him before. And he's like, she did it. I can't believe she did this. And she kept saying that over and over again. I can't believe she did this. And finally I got him relaxed enough to say, and what did she do? Well, she went to the bakery, their favorite bakery, brought cinnamon rolls, his favorite cinnamon rolls and put them on the kitchen island. And I had an open concept so no matter where he stood in any of the rooms of the downstairs, you he could see and smell them. Yeah. Yeah. My weakness. Cinnamon buns are my weakness. <laughs> there you go. I see. And, and he's like, why would she do that? Why would she do that? She knows, you know, that I'm trying to release weight. She was the one that suggested me to go here. So he was just so mad at her until I explained it to him that it, pro- it wasn't malicious on her behalf. There was something in the subconscious mind that was going on for her that him releasing weight was threatening. They've been married for a long time. I don't know that it was, you know, he gets thin and he's gonna leave me. I think there was just something about 
what was going on that was threatening to her. Right. She really didn't intentionally set him up to fail. It was just that kind of thing that happens in all of our relationships, uh, our friendships. If someone is more successful financially than someone else, there might be some sabotage that goes on. It's human behavior. Does it make it right? Maybe not so much. But be careful about sabotaging them. Right. You know, right. Don't go get ice cream with the family and they're in the car. I mean, yeah. That's just right. cruel. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it's just cruel. It is. So and I think you touched on something that's really, really important, too, I think, is um, the need for a role model, like to have role models like we all we all need to be and, and, and where I'm trying to go with my life is I'm trying to become the best human being I can be. And, and that allows me to be a role model to my kids. And, and if if I rub off on them in some way, shape, form, and they they become better human beings, then it's a win for me. And so I, I think you really hit on, a, on an important piece there is, is, you know, be a good role model, which means that I should be eating healthier so that I can be that role model for my wife so that she doesn't have the, the urge to binge. Um, and then and the same thing with our son too, right? Like mm-hmm. be that role model for the son so he's, he's eating properly. And then, you know, you touched on it too, you know, avoiding judgment around food. I know um, my dad's diabetic and I tend to kind of, because he's a little stubborn and I pick at him about, because he has a real sweet tooth and as a diabetic, that's a huge no-no, right? And I, and I poke him about it. And, and I, I'm starting to realize in our conversation, that that's not the right thing to do. Definitely mm-hmm. not. So I'm going to pull back. <laughs> I'm going to stop doing that and, you know, work on being a better role model for him so that he can start to make better choices for himself too. Absolutely. And I, I think that's awesome that you're going to start doing that. And there are so many people think they have to give up. Like I said, they have to give up potatoes. If they're low carb, they have to give up sweets if they're diabetic. Well, there's so many things that are delicious. I still love sweet food. I, I don't plan on giving it up. So there you go. So what do I do? I make a lot of our desserts. And I make them out of almond flour and I make them out of monk fruit sweetener and it tastes delicious and it gives me that satisfaction of what I need, something sweet, something crunchy, whatever it might be. So there are ways to create experiences that may not affect physically. For him, it might be blood sugar. For me, it's the emotion of anxiety. Mm-hmm. so it doesn't it doesn't affect that and yet I can still get that sweetness so there's substitutions we can do too right, right, that right. life is meant to be amazing and life is delicious and food's delicious yeah so right. let's let's make our eating delicious within the guidelines of our food program that we want to stick to so, and feeling satisfied with your food is really really important I think I think you're right. Feeling satisfied with our food is is really important because we do, you know, um, because my wife's a bodybuilder. Uh, we were watching a um, uh, what was it? It was a documentary on Jay Cutler, who was I think he was eight time Mr. Olympia, and he was talking about he never uses seasoning on any of the food he eats because he it's just for him it's fuel, it's not food. He doesn't want it to taste good. It's just fuel because that's what he's eating it for. So do we as humans, do we want to, you know, go down the road of, of indulge in really good tasting food? Because I love good tasting food. And uh, <laughs> I'm on a seafood diet, by the way. <laughs> I see food, I eat it. Um, and so do we, where do we, where do we draw that line between we've consumed enough to feed our bodies? And, and we, you know, how do we, how do we tell ourselves that, hey, I'm satisfied without overeating, like consuming more calories than we're burning. Because really, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a numbers game. You don't want to consume more calories than you're burning. Because if you do, that's when you start to put on the weight, right? So you want to make sure yeah. you're keeping yourself in that caloric deficit to, to either lose weight or, you know, a balance so you're maintaining your weight. How do we as human beings tell when we're full without going, oh my God, I ate too much, <laughs> Well, and unfortunately, 
it's been a learned behavior to overeat, which means okay. that you can unlearn it. No, right. I, I couldn't follow the program he follows. I just couldn't. Food, I want my food to be delicious. The more satisfying satisfaction I get out of the taste, the less I'm going to eat. So that's part of it too. So for me, that's really, really important. It, it needs to taste good. Therefore, yeah. I feel satisfied when I'm finished. And part of it too is, and sometimes it does take measuring and, and weighing, and I really hate that piece of it, but sometimes it does just so we can get our eyes adjusted to what's the appropriate size of portions I, we have I like, been I like again say, i like what you say yeah. there about your eyes because one of the things in our house is our eyes are always bigger than our stomach right <laughs> and it's true i mean the, supposedly the stomach can only hold as much food as a fist so chewed food as much as a fist and if you think about it we have four times that if you go out to a restaurant on the no, plate easy. easy so um and if you keep that in mind, you know, well, my stomach's only as big as my fist, but again, enjoy, I, I have to have seasonings on my food. I, ha I have to enjoy the taste and the textures of my food. I pay really a lot of attention. I'm very mindful when I'm eating. So it doesn't mean I'm ignoring everybody. I'm just, I'm enjoying the taste and the texture and the colors on my plate. And so I'm bringing in a lot of my senses and being mindful. Again, like I said, and maybe practicing every now and then I'll start tracking or I'll start weighing just to make sure my eyes are seeing the right portions when I put it on the plate. And so those are some of the things you can do to change that gap of the behavior we've learned. Right. About how, what size portions are. So, so when it comes to, you know, someone you know, let's say my, my, myself, even, for example, I, you know, I talked about going on a keto diet, but you know, how do I, how do I choose which kind of diet I need to look at going on to? And, and it's, and it's not so much a diet so that once I get to the end, I'm done and I can go back to eating the way I was, but it's more like a lifestyle change. How do I choose which is right for me? Like, is there a process that you go through or how do you do that? Yeah. I ask my clients, what are you not willing to give up. <laughs> <laughs> Cinnamon buns. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, so let's figure out a plan so you can have those every day. No. Once a week, maybe. Once a month, yeah, definitely. We could, you know, figure out that plan. So that's what I do. And and it's based on their belief systems. So do they believe that vegetarian is the way to go? Then that's the way they're gonna go. Uh, it doesn't matter what I believe, it matters what they believe because they're more likely to stick to it because of their belief systems. So that is, you know, like I said, so the first question is what are you not willing to give up? And then from there, could they possibly one day give up that food? Sure, there's a lot of foods I don't eat anymore. When I first started my program, and this is totally my program. This is exactly what I did to release 70 pounds and keep it off for 21 years. When I started my program, I was eating fast food every day and I was not willing to give that up. So in order to, like you talked about, a calorie deficit, right? So you still need to cut back on your calories. How do I go about doing that and still get the satisfaction of eating those foods? And so I cut back to kids' meals. I cut back to, you know, instead of the Whopper, the Whopper Junior, small fry, those type of things. As I was reprogramming my subconscious mind to want to experience healthy foods and to crave healthy foods, which was far beyond what I thought I could do, but that's where I wanted to be. One day, I'll never forget this. It's like a movie in my mind. I walked into Wendy's intending to order my Junior Cheeseburger Deluxe and small fry and Diet Coke. That's what I had at the time. When the cashier asked me what I wanted, I asked for the grilled chicken salad and looked behind me, literally. I thought someone behind me just spoke. <laughs> and then I turned around as she's ringing it up, I realized it was me. For the first time ever, ever, I ordered a salad because I wanted it, not because I had to, because it was on a diet, or I should, because it's lower in calories. I ordered it because I wanted something healthy. Wow. 
and I you know, ordered the dressing on the side, all of that stuff, because I wanted to, not because I had to. And that's when everything shifted, but it shifted because I was changing my mindset about food. And it, it came so easily and so safely. Your brain doesn't like to ch make changes unless it's safe. You know, no. your mind. Your brain, your brain doesn't like change, period. Right? Mm -hmm. so, nope. And it it's going to keep you safe. So exactly. uh, I, think, I think it's really important that, you know, you, you talk about that because, you know, our minds, you know, it takes time to reprogram our mind. It's not like once, once it's done, you can't change. You know, I've learned that, that I can change over time. And, and you can even, your, your brain, according to Joe Dispenza, it can pull neurons from one pathway and repurpose it somewhere else if you stop using that pathway, right? So in, in the case of my alcoholism, that's a great place to go. Right. But becoming aware, making a choice, and then just going through the motions over time allows your brain to make that, that transition to where you actually order a salad because you like to order the salad versus... Right. You know, I used to be a big one for mac and cheese and hot dogs, right? I, that was my staple when I was, mm -hmm. when I was single and, and uh, on my own. And I remember uh, about four years ago, I was working on a pipeline and I figured, well, I'm by myself, I'll go get some mac and cheese because it was quick and simple. And I, and I don't know if they changed the formula of Kraft Dinner, but it was gross. It, like, I just did not like it. I've been eating <laughs> clean for probably five, six years, because my wife was in, into competing and she'd been helping me clean and stuff. And I would get so used to eating clean, you know, that all of a sudden go back to that stuff. And it's just like, oh my God, that's gross, right? So I think it is, is, it is a, a process. I think it is a life choice. Um, but I think also too, there, because we're human, we don't like to, we don't, we don't want to change until we're forced to because okay. change is hard. And like you said, we have to take a look inside ourselves and look at you know what some of those core beliefs are. And I, I'm a strong believer, everybody should have a 12 step program because that's the program that I used to get sober. Uh, the problem is, is unless you're in a life or death situation, going through steps four and five, nobody, everybody quits at that point because they have to look inside. They have to look at all the stuff. And that is very, very painful. And so, you know, helping someone to navigate through that, what's, what would you say is the best? And I want to wrap this up here real quick, but what would you say is the next best step for someone who is at that stage where they're aware and they, they're ready for change, they're, they're willing to lean into it? What's the next step for them? Well, there's actually something that you can utilize that makes it easier, just like with me going in and, and ordering that grilled chicken salad, which I hadn't intended to. And that is the power of self-hypnosis. So you are already hypnotizing yourself. However, you're getting an outcome that you don't want. And you are right. Unfortunately, a lot of us don't change until it's, it's too painful not to. Right. And, and that's 99% of us. There is 1% that will change because of the reward, but that's not very many. Myself included, I am the one that changes because I have to <laughs> of fear of some kind. But, but uh, hypnosis has been the number one way that I have changed my actions and reactions, not only emotionally, but actually going in and, and ordering a grilled chicken salad to my surprise. It happened automatically because at that point, my mind and brain, it felt safe. That was just what I did. So hypnosis is one aspect, self-hypnosis. Then there's another aspect around what do I do when I'm in that craving mode? And you know, I, I don't know about for you, but for me, there's a sense of urgency. So if I have a sudden get a craving, there's a sense of urgency and I have to have it. It's all I can think about. I become obsessed about it, whatever it is. It does, you know, whether it's chocolate or whether it's pizza. And I can't let it go until I have it. And I, it's not just have one, it's have a whole bag or a whole yeah. box. So there's that moment that you can break that cycle. And it's a process called tapping or EFT. And I actually have a video download series that I welcome everyone who's watching and listening to this and get it for free 
at crushcravings.com. Crushcravings.com. And all crush all, cravings. All one word. And, and I'll post that up after after when I go the video. And yeah, uh, and it will show you how to crush your cravings in 30 seconds. And I swear, 30 seconds. I've had people who didn't even have the food in front of them do this technique. And then when they went to get that food, they're like, oh, no, I'm not no, interested. That is awesome. That is amazing. Yeah. I want to thank you so much, Vicky. I mean, you, we, we, we kind of dived into it and unpacked a little bit of it, but we're, we're kind of out of time. I think there's enough here to do uh, part two for sure. So <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and jump on our show because as, as human beings, as per, top performing business owners, not only do we need to be in their best health, but we also need to have our minds in the best place. And, and, and you'd agree what we eat is who we are and we need yeah. to be eating much healthier and a much more um uh in a much more chosen way like we get to choose what we want to do and that allows yeah. us to choose our life going forward right so so again thank you so much vicky i really appreciate it well thank you for having me it's been fun awesome awesome well have a great day 